Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Lead Genius. Higher quality leads and customized customer data at scale. Schedule a free demo at leadgenius.com. And by Citrix GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Visit gotomeeting.com and use the promo code TWIST to begin your free 30-day trial. Hey, everybody. It's an amazing episode of This Week in Startups. The news roundtable is back for the first edition of 2015 with Adam Nash, the CEO of Wealthfront, which has almost $2 billion under management, and David Yulovich from OpenDNS, one of the smartest guys on security on the planet. We talk about Twitter, uh, Facebook, Everybody, Google, it is one of the most amazing episodes of the show because we have two of the smartest people who are drilling down into the issues of our time, like security, privacy, and startups. Amazing episodes. Stick with us. You're going to love it. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can find me on the Twitter at Jason. Yes, I'm showing off. I have the most awesome Twitter handle in the world. Jason Bateman is not happy about it. And you can follow the show at TWI Startups, as in This Week in Startups. The show is twice a week. We do 100 episodes a year. We've done 500 episodes. And you'd think, hey, maybe Jason's getting tired. Maybe he's bored of doing this. You know what? I love it. These are the two best hours of my week on a professional basis is when I get to come in here and talk with the smart people in the industry. And today is an all-time high-water mark for my Emmy award-winning producer, Jackie. Four Emmys, and she's working for me. Pinch yourself, Jason, like you got an Emmy award-winning producer for a podcast? Well, the show's baller now in year six. And we're, it's 2015 now. The show is doing like a half million dollars a year in revenue. It's sold out until May or June. Just great to have amazing sponsors. But what all that means is the production value goes up, the time we put into each episode goes up, the care we put into it, and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger guests. And today on our news roundtable, Adam Nash, the CEO of Wealthfront, of which I'm an angel in, is on the program. Now, you've been on the program one other time as a guest, but the first time on the news roundtable. Wealthfront is doing tremendous. And I own a little tiny sliver of this company. I can't believe it. I am so lucky to be involved in Wealthfront. $2 $2 billion under management now? Is that? Uh, not quite yet. 1.8, 1.9? Where are we? Because I started announcing that was 1.x. Yeah, we finished uh, 2014 uh, at over $1.7 billion. Uh, so we added more than $1.2 billion in 2014 alone, which was pretty exciting. Um, it took $100 us, million a month. Yeah, it, we um, the, the run rate really accelerated. Um, you know, We announced in May that we had hit a billion in two and a half years. Which was exciting because, frankly, the first two years that this service was launched, most people were pretty cynical, skeptical even that something like this could work. Um, And so we were excited about hitting a billion in two and a half years. Um, The truth is we added uh, a billion in less than 10 months towards the end of the year. And and the growth seems to just be accelerating into 2015. It's so funny because Andy Ratcliffe was on the program, famous, famous, famous venture capitalist. He built the product. And he kept telling me like how great Wealthfront was and the big vision. And I didn't kind of get it. And I had him on the program. And wow, he's like just a tremendous entrepreneur and venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. But it is the Uber of financial services in that every problem that you have with your money manager and managing your money just seems to be evaporated. And the cost has gone down at the same time, which is to say, I used to use like you know, one of these big funds to like, or these big, you know, companies to manage my money. And it was annoying to have to interact with a human being. And the fees were ridiculous. 1% of my return every year, 1% on the entire amount of money. Plus, they were putting me into all their devices, mutual funds, whatever, which they were making, what, 25, 50 bips on as well, you think? Sure. So then I realized at a certain point, because I read Henry Blodgett's book about how the fees are the killer in your returns, you guys charge only 25 bips, a quarter of a point. Mm -hmm. What do most money managers charge? Net, 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 at the end of the day, what are people paying to Morgan Stanley, Alliance, Bernstein, all these people, Goldman? You know, people throw around the number 1% is a fairly standard number. The truth is... 
For many folks, it's actually higher than that. One and a half. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about with Wealthfront, to be honest, is, um, look, there's a lot of people competing to offer great service to ultra-wealthy ultra, ultra wealthy individuals. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised at how many people um, have actually voted with their dollars to put large accounts into Wealthfront. Yes. Um, millions of dollars, even over $10 million in one case. Um, but that being said, I mean, our average client has $90,000. What's really driving the momentum is the fact that there's far more people out there who don't have millions of dollars, who mm -hmm. don't meet the minimums of the traditional industry. Yeah. And frankly, they deserve better, right? You know, those fees are massive when they compound over well, years and decades. And if you're only, let's say you make 4 or 5% a year after taxes, they're taking one of the four points. It's not 1%. They're kind of lying when they say 1%. It's really 25% of your return. It is absurd. Now, you're able to do this only 25 bips because you have automated everything. Yeah, it's and about it's built a, the perfect portfolio for people. Well, yeah, I mean, we keep iterating. I mean, our the whole vision with Wealthfront, which I, you know, um, like I said, I was a client before I was an employee. Yeah. Um, but what Andy and, and Dan put together was this idea of what if we took the best practices for the largest pools of capital, the ultra wealthy, and put them into software so that everyone could have them. And 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 the automation really is the key to the economics, right? Mm -hmm. Because, look, software is not perfect at everything. Right. But it's rational. It's precise. Mm -hmm. It's scalable. Um, and, you know, when it comes to money, that precision, uh, that scalability is the key to giving high quality advice, even on simple things, Yeah. Um, in a scalable way. So whether we have 1,000 clients, 20,000 clients, 2 million clients, they're all getting the same high quality of service. And the best part about it, of course, is that you can actually improve software. Right. So right. the traditional industry, they go decades without moving the needle on products and services. We've only been in business three years with our live product, um, but we roll out a meaningful improvement to our investment service in a matter of months. I mean, we actually push code every day. And so the pace of innovation, if you act, asked a lot yeah. of our clients what they love about the service, what they actually love is that it keeps getting better. I know. The software as a service is so wonderful in that way. I have to say, when I switched, and I was friendly with my previous money manager, really sweetheart of a guy, nice guy. He still manages my mom's money right now, which probably is going to end this year because <laughs> I'm over to Wealthfront. Um, but I couldn't even log into my site and understand what was going on with my money on a mobile phone. And just like the basic concept of having a responsive website, let alone an app that was beautiful, and just communication, it was ridiculous. They couldn't get all that done. So anyway, listen, yeah. for people watching, like highest, highest recommendation for Wealthfront. It is the Uber of money management, et cetera. And if I could put my referral code in here, I would, but I can't. But anyway, I love the product. Love being involved. I David Yulovich, you've never been on the program. I have not. But you and I have a bromance going on. It's developing. It's a developing bromance. I feel like I need to be, there's always a disclaimer we, I have did, to we give. We have that week in Italy. We had a week in Italy. Um, but uh, I always put the disclaimers in there if I'm an investor or whatever in the company. But you and I are I'm not an investor in OpenDNS, but we know each other because we were both Sequoia scouts. Mm -hmm. We sort of just met each other a little bit. And then there was a little thing in Italy where a bunch of internet people spent a little vacation and you and I were both there and had a great time. OpenDNS, also a tremendous company doing really well. Just tell everybody what OpenDNS is. You know. Yeah, so OpenDNS is a new kind of security company, and we help protect our customers and their employees wherever they are in the world and whatever devices they're using. And it turns out that that's worked out really well over the last couple of years as more and more people work outside the office and are using myriad devices, Android devices and iOS devices, and are becoming sort of nomadic workers. So we, uh, we have grown and built a cloud-delivered security service as opposed to selling an appliance, which is what most of our competitors like Symantec and McAfee and those guys tend to sell. Uh, and yeah, it's been uh, an exciting ride, certainly for the last few years as we've uh, started our, to chart our journey to be a large enterprise security company. A couple hundred people work at the company, Sequoia's an investor, this is a you know, top flight company. It's yeah. a legit company. Let me ask you about just mobile phones in general. What percentage of people have been compromised on a mobile basis in your estimation in some way or form? Because I, I look at the Apple one, I'm like, oh, nobody's compromised on there, right? And I, but am I wrong or right? Or Well, I think, I think there's multiple answers depending on how you interpret the question. I mean, this is something we talk about internally. Uh, I think in general, the, the answer is that on iOS, a very few number of people have been compromised. Although I think that if you are a foreign diplomat or the executive of a very large corporation, there are active exploits that are out in the wild that are 
very targeted. And think of it not like the kind of typical malware that is like spaghetti against a wall and they just see how many people they can infect. These are more like sniper shots that go after individuals. Ah. So, so, so that is happening in the mobile world, but not sort of the general fast-moving malware that you would see in the PC world. And what's the best practice for individuals? Obviously, like if you use OpenDNS, you're basically encrypting stuff or protecting the device from exploits. Yeah, so we, we, we focus on the network traffic that comes and goes from your phone. Oh. So we, we believe that the, the phone itself is hard to actually secure. So that while there is a, a goal of raising the bar for the actual endpoint, which is what we call the phones and the laptops, our view is that we don't want your phone to ever send traffic to a site that we don't think is legitimate. So we keep track of all the different good and bad sites on the internet, and it's a constantly changing. We have a whole bunch of data that we analyze, and we have 50 million users, and uh, so just like Wealthfront, you know, sort of gets power from more and more users who use a service, and they have more intelligence and can improve their software. We do the same thing by looking at it from a security standpoint. We see all the places that uh, infected users are going on the internet, all the good sites on the internet. We see the associations between those sites, and so if a brand new site emerges and it was registered five minutes ago, and it's you know registered with an address, the you know, that's in Brazil and it's hosted in Eastern Europe and no one that is a what we think is a good user is going there, then maybe we shouldn't let you be the guinea pig and go there either. So we focus on stopping attacks before they ever touch your phone. Speaking of attacks, we're just getting over the Sony hacks. What's the lesson there? And do you believe it's Korea? Uh, I think that a lot of people have strong opinions about who it is. I think that Sony was probably a combination of multiple actors, some of whom may have been working together, some of whom may not have been. Uh, I think it's always difficult when people try to uh, assign a certain government uh, to be responsible for an attack because you could be an attacker that's patriotic about Syria, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Syrian government-sponsored hacker, right? So we often see that there's nation-state groups, some of whom may be affiliated with, with nation-states and some of whom may just be patriotic about some particular geography or, or country. Ah, so levels within the country of participation that might not be like, if it, the sure. example was the United States, it might not be Obama, it right. might be some you know, some democratic party or something. Sure, or, some... or like, if, let's just say there's some teenager who's really patriotic and anti-Korea and goes and defaces a Korean website, that doesn't make them a steward or a representative, you know, an emissary of the United States government hacking a website. They're just right. some guy in, in Tulsa. When we get back, I want to know how you think the United States should respond to these and what is the ramification going to be on a global basis if this continues for businesses uh, on This Week in Startups. Sure. Let me just take a moment to tell you guys about Lead Genius. Uh, this company is genius. And again, um, I'm so lucky because we don't have advertisers on This Week in Startups. What we have is partners. And the partners tend to be people I've, in, in some cases, invested in their company. Lead Genius is such a brilliant company. I actually invested in it. And then they came back and were like, hey, can we sponsor the program because we want to get to startups. What is Lead Genius? I don't have to look at the copy. Getting great leads to your sales team is the key to their success. Now, what if you could magically, like Glengarry Glen Ross, have the Glengarry Glen Ross lead show up, that little deck that everybody salivates over and says, oh my God, I want those leads. Well, if your salespeople didn't have to go and hunt and peck to find all these little leads, if you just outsource that for a couple of dimes a month and get a couple of hundred quality leads, you would do that, right? But nobody's ever built a service like that. Guess what? That's what Lead Genius did. They have these people who are awesome and specialized at finding the leads that will close for your business. They examine your business, they study it, and they take that piece of the pipeline and they outsource it. You give them access to Tout App or Salesforce or whatever you use, Outreach, as a bunch of these different companies. And you give them access to your CRM, and then they start that email chain and the research process, almost as if they're an employee of your company, and then all those leads flow to your uh, team. We're using it here at This Week in Startups and at the launch company. A bunch of other high-profile people are doing it, but they don't want to tell you who... They don't have permission to tell you all the whole profile people using it, because those people don't want to give up their advantage. Well, now you can get the advantage. Go to leadgenius.com slash twist and you will get a free audit of your company's sales process. And these people spoke at the scale conference. Like They know how to craft the entire pipeline. So if you do that free audit with them, you're going to learn something and you don't even have to like, um, you know, use their um, service. But anyway, they Stripe, which is kind of a big deal. Stripe's kind of a big deal. They use them. So if, they, if I use them and Stripe uses them, it gives you an idea if you're trying to build. And it's really about scaling. If you want to scale your Salesforce, use Lead Genius. Uh, again, leadgenius.com slash twist, high quality leads, blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, your sales team is going to love you. And you're just going to, I, my prediction is if you do use Lead Genius, I think you're going to go 20% faster than your competitors. 
If I could tell you you could run 24% faster than everybody else in the race, would you do it? Yes. Duh. Go use it. Leadgenius.com slash twist. Uh, and thanks to my friends at Lead Genius. All right. This is a pretty good commercial read, you think? That was a good pitch. Well, the thing is, if I invest, this is ridiculous. My life is ridiculous now because the show is doing so well that my own investments in portfolio companies are like, we want to sponsor the show. Mm. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not directing that at welfare. But who can do a better pitch than me for an investment that I've made when I love the product? It's amazing. All right. When, we, when you see the Sony hack, Adam, um, and you've been in the industry a long enough time, what, does that change your behavior of a CEO of a major company? Like when you saw that, did you say, we need to have the meeting internally, like Wealthfront needs to lock everything down, two-factor authentication? Um, or are you already on top of that kind of stuff? I mean, you've got a financial services company. Like, this is kind of important. How do you guys look at security? And does it change after yeah. you see something as insane like that? You know, um, obviously, especially when it comes to money, you, you think about security in a different way. Uh, part of that's regulatory, right? We're an SEC registered investment advisor. And part of it's just the domain, right? Mm -hmm. We're not protecting people's profile information or photos. I take mm -hmm. my photos really seriously, but we actually hold uh, money and securities, and, and so that's a big deal. Um, you know, it turns out that, um, earlier in my career, I had the chance to work in security a little bit more deeply. So I've been following this since school, you know, 20 plus years. Um, I always think it's a little foolhardy to think that you're on top of security. The truth is, this is a very dynamic market. The incentives to crack into devices and services only increases with the value of those devices and services. And we've had an explosion in growth and value. Mm. Um, probably the biggest gift that young companies have, like Wealthfront, um, over the traditional industry, and this would include Sony, is that if you're building a new technology stack from scratch in the last few years, you build it differently. Yeah. Right? You don't inherit a lot of software. A lot of the worst invasions in security, not all of them, but a lot of them, have to do with the fact that there are a lot of legacy systems out there, a lot of infrastructure, and they've been duct taped and tied together as, as part of IT projects, mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. Yeah. And companies rarely get around to actually upgrading everything in a uniform, holistic way. So young companies like ours, um, I'm not going to say the problem isn't hard. It's always hard. Right. But the one gift you have is that you don't have an entire division over here that's running on some 20-year-old infrastructure. They may have not the updated the firmware or whatever. They don't even know it exists probably. Oh, I mean, you're you talking know. about software levels on top of operating system levels on devices, network topology. I mean, the complexity is unbelievable, which is one of the reasons why I don't think you're ever going to be fully on top of security. I think yeah. there are best practices. I think, you know, for example, um, you know, when we see heart, uh, heart bleed, I think, um, but, you know, there's exploits that might affect some part of the apology yeah. is we're proud of the fact that not only do we jump on it quickly, mm. um, but we actually proactively tell people what we're doing about it. That's that transparency, I think, um, belies a certain confidence and trust with your customers. I have to say, it's, I became very impressed when I was withdrawing money to a new Bank of America account I had sure. from Wealthfront. And it was like, oh, yeah, we're going to do that like little two deposit thing, put those numbers in, yeah. phone call, email. Like you guys were on it in terms of like, okay, somebody's pulling 100 grand out of an account. Let's make sure that this is legitimately Jason. And I'm assuming that's happening across the board. But the big one for you guys, the big disaster would be if somebody got access to like people's accounts and who is using it and how much money. How do you protect against something like that? The cool. client list. Yeah, well, like I said, I think we have multiple layers yeah. um, of security. Um, and, and like I said, I think that we've done a, a fairly good job with topology. Mm. Um, remember, an application like Wealthfront, a company like Wealthfront, isn't a standalone unit, right? Mm. Like your, your assets... Um, your money is actually with a third-party custodian. Yep. Um, there's a huge amount of security just in having multiple parties that have to actually agree on right. a transaction. Um, there's a little bit of redundancy that's valuable. And, and the good news about money is that there's very few transactions mm. that actually would be materially damaging when they're well known. Yeah. And so you put 80-20, you put most of your effort in making sure mm. that you put a lot of friction around the points that matter while not interrupting and bothering people for situations that are either recoverable or don't matter that much. Because, you know, you can't put full force into everything. We try and put full force into the most important aspects yeah. of our architecture and service. So, David, obviously, you're spending your time on security. When you see Obama, you know, basically interjecting in this, you know, Sony hack, 
and saying they did the wrong thing, they should have released the movie, and he's like sort of inserting himself. And it's not clear exactly who has done the hack. What were you thinking then? You're thinking this is a mistake, the president's got to like sort of wait and see what's actually going on here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a... How I mean, should this be handled? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, a political strategist, uh, but right. I would say that... They, That's what makes this conversation fun. Right, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, I would say they were they were sort of carrying the general uh, diplomatic line that we don't negotiate with terrorists. Right. Right? You don't let the terrorists win. And right. so the idea that regardless if it was nation state or just some cyber hacker group uh, that was demanding that this movie not be released, that you don't give in to those kinds of things because it just begets even more yeah. uh, actions and activity like that. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the the withholding of a movie would probably not have accomplished very much, and I'm sure everyone in this room has seen it. Uh, yeah. I assume you saw it. I uh, saw it. Yeah, so it probably turned out to be an incredibly, uh, you know, in retrospect. There were seven great, hilarious movement, moments. Yeah, th they were. Um, they were in the trailer, so yeah. it's good. Uh, you can just watch the trailer. The, uh, I mean, I'm sure a ton they of people watch the movie. Yeah. Right. The... Uh, a lot of people watch the movie that otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think Obama wanted to just tote the, the line that's pretty consistent, which is we don't negotiate with terrorists. Whether or not the attribution was accurate or not, I think, you know. We're going to see this, like, every month now, you think? I think we're going to see a lot more of it. You know, people talked about 2014 being sort of like the year of the retail breach. And I, I internally, again, at OpenS, we talk about these things all the time. And we would describe it as the year of the retail breach disclosures, uh, ah. which is a very big difference between the year of the retail breach, right? Like the breaches have probably been happening, mm. but for a variety of reasons, both because a lot of these companies are being outed, uh, but either by journalists who are being tipped off. Or now, what do you think of that? The should the journalists be making this their page view machine, when you see Gawker or BuzzFeed or whoever combing through the documents yeah. and they're basically dripping them out like a torture scenario for the <laughs> executives. And I'm not going to say poor executives because yeah. these executives wrote loads of things in their emails in some cases, racist stuff, whatever. What do you think the response should be from the press with these insane, you know, we're going to release something damaging every day on Gawker until we run out of damaging stuff, which seems yeah. like never. Right. There was a lot. There was a lot of information that was leaked. Uh, I think that you know the the privacy issues and the disclosure issues. I mean that you know you don't want to know, know about some kid you know some some person who works at Sony whose kids in therapy like that's nobody's business. Um, there were lots of interesting things that came out, and you know we we would not have known about the MPAA's new attack on the internet if it wasn't for these email dis disclosures. I mean the Motion Picture Association is going to start going after ISPs because they've given up going after the end users, and mm. uh, you know like so there, there are things that come out. I mean information. Obviously, is going to get going to get disclosed when it's been leaked, and I think I don't think you can discuss whether or not it's going to happen because when it, when you do get breached, the information is going to leak. Adam, how does it change the behavior of CEOs, management teams in terms of putting stuff in email? Because Snapchat was having very Evan mm -hmm. um, from Snapchat was having very you know raw discussions with his board, mm -hmm. which include a Sony executive. How does this change? how we all use email and stuff like that. Are you going to see people like, you know what, call me. I'm not putting stuff in email going forward. Are you changing your behavior that way? Um, we haven't we haven't changed that way. I mean, but to be honest, I think that, um, uh, first of all, actually, I, I think in, in a roundabout way, the, the truth is communication is fragmenting anyway. So the days of all my communication going through email seemed like a little window in time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, everything from... Facebook messages, Twitter DMs, Slack text messages. Chat. I mean, yeah, there, there's so many ways to communicate. Um, I'd be surprised if actually the full story was anywhere, including an email. Um, we're actually very careful about communication. We actually try. But th this is the irony. In, in a regulated industry, you actually make special effort to make sure that your communications are logged. Right? Yes, you're required to log. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, we haven't actually changed our behavior. I, I will say that um, maybe it's because of the business we're in or maybe I'm just – not as exciting and interesting as Evan, which is probably likely. Um, but or young <laughs> and inexperienced. <laughs> we're, we're just, um, you know, a lot of our business is actually very pragmatic. Um, we're we're actually fairly transparent as a business. Right. Uh, I wouldn't want you know future product plans leaking, etc. That would be a competitive disadvantage. Um, but um, we. Had but if your email got turned out, it would be like pretty benign. 
I think actually people would be disappointed with how. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, most of it's inside baseball. I think yeah. most people don't care. I mean, my parents don't care about the Snapchat leaked emails. And uh, you know, I think most people, don't, even people that use Snapchat don't really care about the contents of those emails. I think we care because it's inside baseball and it's hard to, it's hard to not look. Uh, but most of us read them and they're just like, you sort of, you read what you expected to read. Yeah. Except when the executives at Sony are making racist jokes about the president or talking about Adam Sandler, sure. who they have this huge partnership with and what a disaster it is. I don't understand these people in Hollywood who would ever put this stuff in writing. I assume right now that my email has been compromised. Right. I write emails as if I'm typing them as tweets. Everything I write into a hip chat chat room or a text I assume has been compromised and would be published on Gawker publicly. All the time. That's yeah, I mean, my benchmark. Who right. are these people who behave differently? We, we know that, I mean, I think we know and you know all these things are true that like anything you write in an email could be on the front page of the New York Times, right? Yeah. And on and Gawker or whatever. And so we know that. So maybe it's a wake up call to the rest of these people that just thought that like their quick little Blackberry little message or, you know, hopefully at this point they've switched to an iPhone, their quick little iPhone message actually is an email that somebody somewhere one day will show up in a courtroom or on the front page of the New York Times. I mean, that, that level of user education certainly I think needs to happen. I mean, younger kids, I think, understand it. They use Snapchat with the perception that it's that it's ephemeral. This is why I think yeah. like CyberDust and some of these other things, like in a corporate environment, the there's one group of people, obviously mm -hmm. finance, that have to record everything that's done. But I think everybody else is going to start looking at HipChat and Slack and saying, can we have an ephemeral version where everything is destroyed permanently, we don't have it after 30 days. So our, our corporate security folks a couple months ago switched hip chats, document retention policy stuff on. So now after 75 days, everything is auto purged from the logs. So you can't search back past 75 days. Do you think hip chat has a copy of it in their backups? Somewhere in the side of the mountain, I'm sure that they do. But and I, then would that be actually subpoenable? Uh, I think it'd be tenuous because they would describe it as sort of not be not it would be you know some sort of archaic cold storage. Uh, um, so hopefully they don't have it, but I'm sure maybe somewhere. You know, see, that's going to be somewhere. the future thing is some service is going to. This is going to be the selling point of a lot of these services is if you s click this button in the settings, not only do you not have the ability to go past 75 days, we don't. Right. And that would be worth paying for. We've actually built that into our service. Yeah. We, so as a cloud service, uh, you know, we log all this stuff in our data centers, but we have customers who are, you know, Fortune 100 enterprises, and they have us stream directly back into their infrastructure, the logs, and we don't ever keep a copy of it. Brilliant. All right, when we get yeah. back, I want to talk about the CEO, uh, brujas and shuffles of the moment. Um, Sophia from uh, Nasty Gal is uh, hired as CEO. Uh, people are talking about... DeCostolo at Twitter and maybe Adam Bain taking his spot or not. That sounds a little weird. And then uh, Marissa at Yahoo when we get back from this important break. Okay, hey, uh, this is another one of these ad reads that goes easy. Unfortunately, I'm not an investor in Citrix's go-to meeting, but I use it all the time, and it's critical to have your meeting start on time, and it's critical to have the bandwidth work perfectly and audio be perfect. That's why I don't use free services. That's why I have three, literally three accounts here on my companies to do go-to meeting. The go-to meetings are all set up with headsets, HD cameras in all of my conference rooms. Everything starts on time. I do not let other people use their own conferencing service. Like literally, I can count the number of times last year I let somebody else set up the conferencing system as like really important person. I couldn't really dictate to them, uh, use my system. Um, and the reason is I need this stuff to start on time. I need it to work on every platform. And I need to have uh, screen sharing and HD video that's perfect and flawless. And that is what uh, Citrix GoToMeeting provides. I've been using it for years. You've been hearing me talk about it for years. Um, go to GoToMeeting.com and click the Try It Free button. And you'll see why millions of people are choosing GoToMeeting. Start hosting your own face-to-face -face online meetings today. And uh, you get what you pay for. I mean, that's what I always tell people. It's like such a small amount of money to have perfect meetings. And if you use free stuff... You're going to have all kinds of bandwidth issues because they're not separating the bandwidth and they're not, they don't have dedicated infrastructure for this purpose. Um, so, uh, you know, it works on Mac, PC, tablet, smartphone, all that stuff, which I've done many times. I've been on the road. I've been able to get literally, uh, my wife was driving. I literally uh, took out my phone and I watched the screen share and I took out my iPad, Verizon, both cases, Evda, and uh, 4G, Evdo, whatever. And I was like watching the screen share and had my headset on my phone, two different devices, logged into the same meeting. Nobody knew I was driving. 
with my wife and the kid in the car. Amazing, right? That's because GoToMeeting is flawless. Go to GoToMeeting.com, try it free for 30 days. Um, and thanks to our friends at Citrix is their uh, Twitter handle and at GoToMeeting. They make a great product and it's flawless. All right. So um, people are talking about Marissa, Yahoo. Uh, maybe there was a big New York Times story by a Business Insider writer. I'm sure you guys read it. What is your guys' take on the job Marissa has done in 30 months? If you were on the board, would you be looking to replace her? Go ahead, Adam. Oh, give me the easy one. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah. Well, look, uh, you know. Marissa doesn't watch the show, so don't worry. She's it, not going to see it. In the interest of full disclosure, yes. of course, uh, Marissa is an investor in Wealthfront, and I've known her for almost 20 years. Oh, good. Uh, well, that's good. Let's hear it. Yeah. Um, so, you knew uh, her from Stanford. Yeah. So what I, was she I, like in college? Uh, you know, in many ways, she is very true to herself. She is, uh, I, I don't see her as much of a different person. She's been immensely successful for a lot of very good reasons. Why? What do you think the number one reason for her success is? You know, um, I don't know. I don't want to get philosophical, but there's a lot of people, especially if you, if you have the privilege of going to uh, some of the better schools, et cetera, you meet a lot of brilliant people. Mm -hmm. And you realize that there's some people who coast on that brilliance. Yeah. Um, and there's some people who actually always are working harder to do more. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like they want to leverage every ounce they can while they can. And, and right. Marissa's definitely in that second category. She, She's a hard worker. She, she doesn't know how to not intensely dive into anything that is either interesting um, or necessary. Right. Um, and actually, even that combination, I think, is, is pretty phenomenal. And so um, I, I think the job at Yahoo, um, you know, a company the size and scale of Yahoo, an industry that's shifting this quickly, let's, uh, frankly, I think she took on an unsolved problem. Yeah. Right? Like Some people might say unsolvable. You know, but... Um, you Not know, that anything's unsolvable, but people have said that. Yeah. So, you know, just my personal bias. Yeah. I think that there's a growing recognition lately, which I'm actually very excited about, of people recognizing that there's huge value value in not just long-term strategy, which I was a talking point, but but long-term leadership and, and both the time and the metal to dig in and execute on things that may take years and years to develop. Right. Uh, you know, I'm in the tech camp that says, you know, in the short term, we, we overestimate what can be done with technology and the long term, we underestimate it, right? The Bill Gates quote. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so when I look at, yeah, I, I, you know, personally, I think that everyone knew going in um, that there was a lot that had to change. There was a lot of uncertainty about what Yahoo needed to be. What is Marissa two years into? Yeah, thirty into months, this? two and a half. And so, um, so I'm, I'm a little surprised at you know I feel like every four months there's this parabolic love hate thing about uh, about it. But um, I will tell you when it comes to talent in the valley. I mean, I'm one of those biased folks in the valley who thinks that you look at what really smart engineers and designers might think about working for a company. Yeah, that's a good tell. And I personally see a massive change in attitude from three years ago before Marissa was there. I see incredibly 180 degrees. Incredibly brilliant engineers and designers who could work at any number of companies actually saying, I would work for Marissa. I yeah. would work for Marissa. They I think are we going. Can do yeah. Something. yeah. And so um, uh, that's amazing by itself. I think, see, that's exactly what I wrote in my piece, which was if you just take that as one metric, the most important one, the, none of these problems can be solved without talent. Right. None of the other people who've been in charge of that company since Terry Samo, mm -hmm. I think Terry gets maybe not a lot of credit. I think he actually did have a lot of talented people there, like Toby Koppel and um, Sue Decker, and they actually did the Alibaba. Like th That was a successful tenure, uh, clearly, and they were very early to video. But if you look since then, has anybody made it a place that people want to bring their talents you know, to, to try to help grow. What do you see, David? Yeah, I, mean, I think, first of all, it takes a long time to turn around a company. I mean, I have a company that's, that was tiny, and in 2010, we essentially had, to the end of 2009, we had to rebuild the company. And it took us two years to really get our footing back, rebuild the team. It was almost a complete rebuild of the team, rebuild the product for the enterprise audience. I mean, those it takes time. And she is a multi-billion dollar company, and she's made, I think, incredible strides forward. Uh, it is... Uh, I think the talent conversation, that, that piece of it is, is critically important. But even, even when you look at their acquisitions, it seems like they're making long-term bets. Uh, there are smart people that she's keeping there that are retaining. I mean, we interview people from Yahoo. Sometimes we hire them, and sometimes they stay at Yahoo because they see that there's a, a vision there that they believe in. It used to be easier to get those people. Yeah, I mean, they were, they, were, they were jumping off the ship. I mean, she had, I think, a lot of cultural issues that she had to fix. And she got criticized for quite a few of them, like the, the working from home thing. Right. But she, she knew that she had to basically you know, change, do do that 180. I mean, you don't do a 180. For, the perception of a 
180 change doesn't happen just by perception. You have to make a little bit of a 180. And in order if to people that, are, it's going to cause she got some, criticized. For, she got yeah. friction for it. And uh, you know, frankly, maybe those aren't the people that uh, that she wanted to have on board, or maybe they were the wrong people at the wrong time, or maybe they just needed to adjust their view on how to make Yahoo the best at that time. Maybe two years from now, she can go back to a looser work from home policy. But right. you know, if you're turning around a ship, maybe you need everyone on the ship. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now let's uh, skip over to uh, Twitter. A bunch of, again, activist investors. They seem to be controlling the dialogue because the press eats up with these activist investors stay. But now another group of activists say, oh my God, Twitter is not growing fast enough. Well, it's grown every quarter, right. you know, and it's it's got a growth curve that's very respectable. It's not supernova, but the certainly the revenue has been and the acquisitions have been pretty good and the talent is amazing. What are your thoughts, Adam, on Twitter and DeCosta Lowe and the job he's doing over there? Yeah, and um, uh, <laughs> full disclosure, Dick is an yeah, investor. Yeah. No, no, actually, Dick is not an investor. He's a oh. big fan and supporter, and I think it goes back to his early DNA. He actually cares about his employees' financial well-being. Oh. They invited us in to talk three weeks before the IPO. Oh, that's nice. Um, and actually, at this point, somewhere around ten percent of all U.S. Twitter employees are clients of Wealthfront. It's our number four source of clients. So we've been pretty number close. four. Yeah. Oh wow, that's great. Um, and so um, I always have a lot of respect for a company that creates that much value in a product and a business that has that much value and shares it with their employees. Um, but, you know, I think Twitter's another one. Um, Twitter's a different situation than Yahoo because I think Yahoo historically had several points of clarity about what they are. But yeah. then the market shifts, so they have to reinvent themselves. That's what happens when you're 10, 20 years in the business. Um, I think uh, Twitter is more still growing up into what it could be, right? right? And people forget how young the service is, right? I go back to my earliest tweets, you know, 2007. And, you know, like we were still at the point where we were thinking, like, what do I tweet about? Like, what I just ate? You know, like, is this, you know, like, no one knew what it was for. Now you have hashtags that are organizing 40 world leaders and people are, you know, getting Yeah, I mean, together. entire uh, movements, the world is being driven by hashtag movements. Yeah, so, the, the, you know, there's global community. Communication platform is unbelievable. So everyone has their own view of what Twitter could be. I think that reflects the opportunity. Uh, it's hard to manage inside that. Um, so I've been impressed uh, with Twitter Date. I mean, I, I'm a heavy user of the service, so I have my own list of features that I wish they would prioritize, and I think everyone else does. Um, What's number one in that list? What do you most think they, you know, for you and for the service, you know, if you were running it, I mean, you're actually would be a CEO candidate for a company like that. What would you, what feature would you focus on next? That's a good question. I mean, I'm always, this is the problem. I'll show my background as a product guy. Like, you know, you never uh, have any uh, shortage of list of features that you want sure. in a company. And you always think that by hiring more people, you can get more and more done. But the truth is, if you're hiring smart people, they tend to bring more ideas than they can personally execute on. Right. So actually, the list gets worse and worse as you grow. And Twitter has some of that because I think they have external pressure, internal. I mean, a lot of the things, I'm a user, right? So they probably are not revenue optimized, etc. I do think, you know, I'm one of those people in the camp that thinks that, you know, Twitter, and I understand why they had to take control of their developer ecosystem at the time they did or why they made that choice, um, but that cut down the variety of user experiences that people could have ah. with Twitter. And I think right now they're trying to figure out which new experiences they have to invest in internally mm -hmm. because that ecosystem isn't there anymore to build radically new interfaces. And that was a conscious choice to right. make Twitter unified. Um, but I happen to be, you know, a platform guy, I run around platform on LinkedIn, yeah. engineering background. And so, um, you know, for me, it's always, I always think like, they don't have to build every interface. Like, you know, someone else could build this interface, that interface, but that's my They went through guys, and yeah. basically cut everybody off. They bought TweetDeck, they bought yeah. uh, Smize for search, and they bought another Twitter, uh, client and then they did all the apps. But you're saying now, hey, maybe let other people make apps and make other products around the Twitter data and Twitter experience. Well, I think you can't have a I think you can't have a platform unless you know what you are. Ah. Right, like that's the hard part. You have to know what your business is, where you add so value, you don't when lose. you open up. When yeah. we did the LinkedIn platform, um, we had a really good sense of what LinkedIn was and what it wasn't, and it wasn't perfect, um, but it allowed us to be more open in some ways mm. and more closed in others because we knew at least what our business was and what we could promise to developers yeah. and what we couldn't. It's yeah, the very business hard. was selling recruiters five thousand yeah. dollar a year access to contact people. So right. anything outside of that was fair game. Although it's unclear that they can get developers back. I mean, I think that developers, you know, it's like your platform is the internet, right? My platform is the internet. Developers who built on the original Facebook platform, I think saw initial early success and then saw it 
basically pulled out from under them. And, and that put, would be like Branch Out, Zynga. Yeah, all this. A lot the, of companies the music, raised money. Things, you know, yeah. I, I meme, I think was one of them. Slide. Right? Yeah, Slide, sure, all of these things. And then uh, same on Twitter platform, there were a bunch of developers and they felt like the rules changed a little bit. So I think it's tough. I think that it is true that that was a bummer, but but an understandable why they made those changes. One of the things I heard recently was that verified users get a cut of the ad revenue from their feed. Is that true? No. No, okay. That was something I've been promoting and well, trying that, to do. I, I think they certainly, as an end user, you asked, you asked about features. One of the things that I think is cool is, and, and everyone is every, you know, everyone likes to stroke their own ego, and so Twitter now shows you sort of the, the analytics of your individual tweets in the mobile If you're client. verified. No, I, I get Oh, you get too. them too? Yeah, and I'm not really? verified. Even I'm just a regular, like a normal, I'm, I'm just average. <laughs> You're show. verified, right, Adam? I'm not verified. What I'm, the? Yeah. Please, <laughs> hey, hello, message to uh, whoever does verified. CEOs are critically important. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, and, uh, anyway yeah, when you see your individual tweet opens analytics. and stars. Yeah, and it's awesome. And uh, I think everyone wants to see that. And yeah. uh, those things to me encourage engagement. I go back and I check it. Um, I think those kinds of features that focus on sort of the things that make users more engaged with the platform, more mm -hmm. more likely to keep using it, and, and really understand that you know Twitter is a lot of things for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, people want to know whether or not they're reaching, how many people they're reaching, how many people they're engaged with. Yeah. Uh, and so I think those things are it's pretty It's about 10% cool. of my followers eventually when I do tweets, wind up seeing it, or and five, I would say five to ten percent of my total two hundred thousand. So probably half of the accounts on Twitter are not are dead. Maybe two thirds. So if you have two hundred thousand followers, you really have a hundred. If you have a hundred and ten thousand people see it, which would be five percent of the two hundred thousand number. That seems to me to be pretty True. good. Yeah. The other thing about Twitter is they own Mopub, and I think a lot of people forget that they own Mopub. Explain what Mopub is. So Mo Mopub is their advertising network for mobile mobile advertising, and they bought that. I forget how much they paid for for Mopub, but it was a really smart acquisition, and I think it's probably going to continue to be a very large part of their revenue stream. And this is a it's kind of like what AdWords and AdSense were to the to the uh, web. Uh, Mopub can be for mobile applications, right? So some of the ads that Twitter shows are on Twitter proper and in the, the clients and on the mm -hmm. website, but some of these ads can actually be embedded in other applications, and it really, I think if you think about how big AdWords and AdSense got, yeah, Mopub has that same potential, and it's certainly, if they're not the largest, they're, they're one of the largest players in that, in that space, aren't they? I think they're up there, and they're doing an entire suite of products now, including Crashalytics, which I've been using for Inside, which is an amazing product. So they're giving all these developer tools away. I think they've, rebuilding. Made, they've made smart acquisitions. Ver I mean, Vine is tremendous. Right. right. I think that Twitter could become um, a house of brands that could become extraordinary. So if they bought, I recently invested in Shots, you know, which is sort of like an Instagram competitor, but it's more for like younger people and Justin Bieber is like crazy on or whatever. Um, if they bought like a Shots and had like a photo app over here, they have Vine over here, you know, if they had a news app, if they bought Circa, or if they bought, you know, I'm an investor in that. Um, but if they bought other, yeah. it sounds like I'm selling my portfolio. But no, but if, then they have a way to monetize it. They have ways to monetize yeah, it, and right. then they could have this whole suite of products that, again, taps into the, the Twitter data, the Twitter authentication, all this. It could be very powerful, I think. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, as, as a product guy, I think... Um, and look, I, I realize that I'm the exception case, right? I'm someone who blogged for a long time. I came to Twitter with some biases, what it means to be a public personality, mm -hmm. what it means to talk in public. Um, and so, you know, my Twitter feed is an incredibly curated feed around a combination of signal to noise, my different interests, when things get emphasized. Um, I, I think they've taken many swings at it, but what you're reflecting uh, in terms of acquiring other products, though, is that there's still this question of, you know, I, I have family members and friends who are not technical, et cetera, and some of them seem to take to the current Twitter experience quite well, and, and some of them don't know what to do with it. Right. And it's this incredibly configurable experience because who you follow... Um, is your experience. Right, is right. your experience. Um, and I think they've known that for a long time, but turning that into the different use cases, um, you know, actually can be a problem. You know, LinkedIn um, is a very general platform. The truth is being a salesperson is very different um, than being an engineer, right. right? Or being a lawyer, right? Or running a small business or being an investor. And so usually these platforms start out very generic. And the hard part is, well, how, when do you 
when do you create custom experiences for different use cases or audiences? Do you do it under your brand? Do you do it separately? I mean, it's amazing now to look at the Instagram acquisition years later. Um, and I always laugh at the amusement about how many kids are on Instagram all the time uh, and don't realize that it's part of Facebook. Right? Yeah, you know, it's, very it's smart move for Facebook to never mention Facebook on there. Right. I have to say, if you think about Zuckerberg's track record on acquisitions, WhatsApp and Instagram are just extraordinary you know, values, aren't they, David? Uh, well, for sure. I mean, I mean, they're, both of those things, I think, at the time, people said, wow, you know, Instagram for a billion dollars, that it's ridiculous, right? It's outrageous. Now it'd be worth and, what? Uh, 10, what did they 20, say? No more, I think people have said. Yeah, on its own, standalone. And uh, certainly the same thing with WhatsApp. I mean, I never, no one, in the, I think, in the Valley was inside the WhatsApp bubble. I mean, the WhatsApp bubble was inverted. It was the entire world except for Silicon Valley. Yeah, it was people who didn't want to pay SMS charges right. around the world. We don't have that problem. And it's like, well, a bunch of rich people in Silicon Valley are like, I'm sorry, I don't even know what my phone bill is. Right. You know, like somebody's paying that. I have. I don't know what that is. Why would I need to yeah, get Yeah, you go international and every single person's using WhatsApp. That's right. Yeah. All right, Sophia uh, from uh, Nasty Gal is uh, the girl boss herself is res has resigned or she gave somebody the CEO slot. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, someone who runs a company for eight years and uh, up until recently owned the entire company or the vast majority of the company yeah. uh, certainly may decide that they want to spend their time on other activities or just not have to deal with the day-to-day -day responsibilities of being CEO, and that's certainly uh, uh, understandable. Uh, I think it's tough sometimes. Companies have to watch very carefully. I mean, you guys did a, a CEO transition, but you all had mature, you know, seasoned entrepreneurs in, in your transition, I think. And uh, But it, it can be tough from a cultural standpoint when you bring in a CEO without maintaining all the things that already made the company great. And uh, I think with, you know, with Nasty Gal, the company's already been a phenomenal success. And so I think the, you know, their challenge is how do they continue to be a phenomenal success uh, while, while changing the, the leadership at the top. And this happened shortly after venture funding. This is, true. this is what I was telling you before. I think that you know, there's certainly a, a stereotype that VCs come into a company and and replace the founder, and it certainly appears from the outside without knowing. I don't, and I know nothing. I don't even know Sophia. I don't the know. The timing is there. Yeah, the timing is there. That you know, a year or so, a year and a half or so after a venture uh, investor finally got in the door at Nasty Gal, there's there's a new leadership. So, but I, who knows if there's a connection? I'm sure she still controls the company. I, I hope yeah. not. You know, um, I was heavily influenced. We're all influenced by our mentors and our experience right. and people we've learned from. And you know, I learned a lot from. Reed um, uh, Hoffman, and then of course Jeff Wiener's done a phenomenal job at LinkedIn. Um, I think we all know we, we we've been around the valley long enough. We've seen technology companies come and go. Um, there's a certain moral authority that founders have when they run their companies that allows them to take on hard situations, that allows them to move a new and, and make difficult decisions. That it's very hard for someone who's not a founder to take on. Now Reed's fostered this, and he's written about it. Has been um, this idea of continually imbuing leadership with that moral authority, right? I think he really has imbued Jeff with the moral authority to make tough decisions at LinkedIn. Um, and by the way, Reed is still around all the time, very active with LinkedIn. I think that helps. Andy, I think, uh, Ratcliffe, of course, well in the same camp where um, he never saw himself as an operator, an expert there, yeah. really had a passion to get Wealthfront going, was very excited um, to find someone who shared that passion. I, I feel that both Dan and Andy have been very generous, giving me the moral authority both inside and outside the company to speak for Wealthfront. Um, but you also earn that over time and by your actions and your words and people see your behavior. So um, I hope it was one of those transitions. Um, it, it sounded like from the announcement she's executive chairman. Um, I haven't uh, yeah. talked to her personally about it, but um, you know, I hope because the truth is that the kind of transition that we were discussing where you know that I want to say throwback to the era where VCs would come in and then swap out the founder for a more seasoned CEO. Seems like um, that over. didn't typically work right. as well as finding ways to develop either develop the founder and have them grow with the company um, or find that kind of partnership where you divide up. Because the truth is there's a lot that needs to get done to build and lead a company and sometimes people are suited for one part of that role rather than Yeah, but in both those cases though, Reed had already been at PayPal mm -hmm. and had seen success and seen what transitions look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the same thing, you know, with, 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 Wealth, with Wealthfront, you had come from an entrepreneurial background, you had seen success. Everyone, all the players involved were mature 
mature enough and probably a little bit unemotional enough to say, hey, this is this is the right thing, where they made the personal choice themselves and saying, hey, I want to start this thing, but I don't want to be the operator, right? Those, those are, I think, I think those are rare examples. Uh, in many cases, I think, you know, like you said, when they when the transition does happen, it rarely it rarely works out for the for the better. Uh, when there is sort of that that founder vision, that handoff isn't done properly. I think the time invested in trying to make it work is generally better spent trying to course correct the the founder CEO. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the unbundling that is occurring. Um, you're going to have. Um, uh, CNN and ESPN and a bunch of other channels now available through Sling, which is uh, mm. a subsidiary of is it Comcast who bought it? No, it's Dish. a satellite company. At Dish. Uh, Dish bought it. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, we have the Golden Globes and Amazon wins for Transparent. Have you guys seen Transparent yet? I haven't. Incredible. I have not. It's the best series of the last year, maybe in the top three. Um, and the great unbundling seems to be upon us. What, what impact do you think this is going to have uh, in the media space now? Oh, in media. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been fairly public about it. I mean, uh, caveat that I'm not an expert in the industry, although yeah. I'm an avid consumer of movies yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and media and always have been. Uh, I think a lot of it has been waiting for some time, right? Like you learn in school that oligopoly is this kind of collusion isn't very durable. Eventually it breaks down because yeah. of disparate interests. And I think we've all been watching cable for the last decade kind of going like, you know, like I, I feel like ESPN and HBO are like, hold that line, hold that line. And then you knew fundamentally, though, that the, the, the pressure for consumers, the diversity of content that wants to be out there, yeah. the diversity of packages that people want, that once that unbundling started, it was going to be very hard to put your finger back in that dam. And so, um, I mean, kudos to Netflix and then the others actually – who, who followed the lead. Um, I think yeah, it was amazing to me watching because, frankly, I think a few years ago when they went down this path, would anyone have actually said that, wow, some of the best content would be coming out sponsored by Netflix and Amazon? I think they said the opposite. Yeah. These people, Amazon and Netflix, yeah. are going to lose their shirts. Right. Well, despite, They don't know how to do it. Yeah, despite the fact that, I mean, when I was uh, growing up, of course, HBO was that original success story where they started just rerunning movies, right? And right. you had to pay for it separately. By the way, it wasn't bundled back then, right? Right. And um, you got that weird antenna and that sort of thing. And um, I remember, the, I remember wow, my dad having to set back. that up. You know what's roof. crazy? In they Brooklyn, yeah. they had these antennas, yeah. and the mafia guys in Brooklyn, this is a true story, went around to all the bars and everything, and they would give them uh, HBO, and they would then go to the whole apartment buildings on that block. This was the racket a lot of the mob guys were in. They would give HBO, you weren't allowed to have HBO in bars and stuff like that because they had the fights. So what they would do is they would put the antenna up for one of the apartments. They would go to all 20 apartments and say, give us $5 a month, give us a hundred bucks, one time fee, whatever, we'll put it in your apartment. And they would just splice the cable. Right. They would just, and they had figured out how to do the boxes and the boxes would get bulleted. Then the bars would show the things. Then what they started doing was the HBOs of the world started going to the bars in Brooklyn and other places to see who had the Tyson fight or whatever fight on, mm -hmm. who didn't. And then they'd give them a post bill. They would count everybody in the place and they'd say, we want 20 bucks ahead. There were 200 people in here who were $4,000, and they did it to all these bars, and then people stopped doing it. It's pretty crap. What do you think of the unbundling that's occurring? Yeah, I mean, now? I think this is something that— Are you a cable subscriber? I'm barely a cable subscriber. <laughs> so you're thinking I, of I, unbundling, I have reduced and you myself are... to the most basic of packages, which now at this point means I couldn't watch whatever football, sport ball game was on last night. So you're uh, super I affluent. I saw the tweets, and I was like, oh, You're a millionaire, and you <laughs> don't— want to pay the extra 40 bucks a month. That's right. And, and what uh, about you, Adam? You still have it. I, I'm making up for his... Uh, Did you cut or no? Uh, no, no, no. I uh, still pay an awful lot to cable. You're paying like 100 bucks a month? I, I, you know, I cut this year. Really? Done. Yeah, and you don't, you don't regret it at all. I don't regret it. You I know mean, what? It, I, my TV watching has become so deft. That's right. I watch only the best. As it should be, your time is valuable, and uh, and I think that you know people want to be able to pay for things like HBO. They want to pay for individual shows. You know, iTunes made that a little bit easier to pay for individual shows. Yeah. They don't have the major the major channels people care about. Like they don't. You can't get HBO. In it. You can stream HBO, but only if you're a cable subscriber. Right. And so that now that final domino is starting to fall, mm -hmm. and you see it with with the Sling uh, equipment. And I mean, I think that's a huge milestone. I mean, they're effectively doing what Aereo did, but in a, in a slightly you know they're not doing it with that like that weird technology antenna thing. They did it through licensing, which is probably right. So everybody's going to get path. paid the same way. It's just a bundle. That's. Well, I don't think everyone's going to get paid the same way. I don't think Comcast well, is going to get paid. Let's, hmm. let's also be clear. Like, I'm a big fan of unbundling. Wealthfront is itself a form of unbundling. Yeah. Um, and the reason I like unbundling is because it turns out in er eras of, of, of low innovation, 
it makes sense to kind of put packages together and price them because the aggregate money into the system benefits from the simplicity, right? Like you have a few packages, yeah. you charge everyone. Um, but like I remember thinking as we were transitioning to the cloud, you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? Could you really build Adobe the same way in a world where people didn't pay a thousand dollars for Photoshop up front and no one cared about the usage, right? And, and, and maybe but they're, but they're some people doing that now, right? You can subscribe to Adobe Photoshop. Oh no, no I know, but yeah. it's not an easy transition. I mean, it's been twenty years coming. So sure. I mean, I I would love now it. you subscribe to the suite for twenty bucks. I think bucks unbundling is pa painful for some folks because the truth is it may turn out that the aggregate amount of dollars increases, but there are pretty significant amounts of winners and losers, right? And some of those I winners may not have existed correct. before, right? You know, some right. of those dollars will route to media platforms that didn't have anything. Well, it might be like AMC TV is undervalued in the package. ESPN is overvalued. So yeah. people are paying for this bundle, but they don't watch the ESPN yeah. channels, but they're crazy about the AMC shows or whatever. Or theater revenue. Like, I mean, you know, unbundling, you think about movies, I have to think really hard now about, I'm still like a traditionalist. Like I said, I love all these experiences. I have kids now. It's like, yeah. I like taking them to the movie theater. They go see Big Hero 6. We all do it together. Um, but I've thought a lot lately about what that experience really needs to be. Like, um, that's not really an experience for my wife and I anymore. That's more right. of an experience I want to share with my kids. But how long is that going to be profitable in its current form or even economically viable and what replaces it? Um, so some of those dollars may come out of even um, adjacent industries. Yeah. Um, it'll be more dollars, I'm convinced, because I'm an optimist. But we may be surprised at the winners and losers that come out. In, in the short term, it also might be more expensive for consumers, right? Because things that are unbundled generally wind up cost more per, like on a, on a piecemeal basis. I mean, we see this with enterprise applications. Now you like you pay for Salesforce, you pay for Google Apps, you're paying for HipChat, you're paying for all these disparate services. It ends up sort of costing a lot of money. Yeah, you used to pay $1,000 per person to Microsoft or whoever right, you had a license. for a bundle. It was perpetual. Right. Well, perpetual until they upgrade three well, years you didn't, later. Right, you didn't get to upgrade, but you got yeah. you got you could use it at least as long as you wanted. You didn't right. have to stop paying and then lose it. And now these things like Slack are eight bucks a person. It yeah, that's a little bit cheaper. But that's why you see the platforms absorb it. Like I look at Amazon, it's a large platform. They have this relationship with a huge number of customers. And I think they're always experimenting about what else they can push into that relationship. I mean, in the retail world, I'm always a fan of Costco. And they've been very innovative about right. what they can push into that channel. Um, and so I, I do think that there's uh, the winners term, and Long term, it'll be a benefit. And I, I think there'll be new winners for sure. I mean, look at BuzzFeed and media. Yeah. Uh, how so? I mean, nobody reads Newsweek anymore. I mean, the Bitcoin story was like the nail in the coffin for, for Newsweek. I mean, all of those, the old ways of doing journalism have changed. I mean, I'm also, I would say, a media junkie. Yeah. And, you know, it's like Rolling Stone's UVA story. I mean, these things are, like, to me, the, like to me, they're just like the final, the, like, sort of embarrassing nails in the coffin. And people are now looking at, like, I can just go to BuzzFeed and I can get real news. I can get funny listicles. I can get whatever I want. And, you know, they have independent writers. I mean, you don't have to go work for BuzzFeed now to even publish on BuzzFeed. I mean, it's right. Sort of, you know, that, that's, that is a that is a it is a platform. Right, medium is a platform. Well, the best thing yeah, about, medium is a platform too. That's the right. best thing about unbundling, in my view, is that by freeing up the consumer, those dollars routing can then be reinvested in the things consumers want more of. Right? You know, um, when I think of the Wellfront service. Um, you know, we keep iterating and innovating on this piece of this puzzle, this long-term investment management. Yeah. But I mean, in an industry where they used to kind of make these innovations in every five to 10 years, right? We're rolling out new features and services every few months. Sure. And so I'm excited about the content side because, you know, because I, I, I'm a content junkie, I'm hoping that I'm voting with my dollars if I can push them and yeah. say, actually, I like, you know, I, I'm a huge HBO fan, right? right? HBO, I love it when they invest in new shows. There's a lot of other things HBO does that I wasn't as exciting about. Sure. Um, you know, the pure play for me of saying, no, no, I like series like this, make more like this. They have 32 million Americans and 100 million people overseas. If they were available direct, what? how would those numbers increase, David? Well, I was actually thinking more that maybe this is a pendulum that's just always is going to swing back and forth because we see it in security now where people used to just, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they'd buy Symantec and they'd be like, Symantec, do all my security. And then that lowered the bar precipitously for the quality of security you got because it was sort of like a best <coughs> effort across a bunch of different categories. And now people unbundle it and they use Okta for authentication, right? They use OpenDNS for network security. They're using Sky High for visibility into cloud, so SaaS applications, right? They're picking piecemeal vendors that are best in class. 
they might end up right now being paying a little bit more because they can't just like throw one check at one vendor. Right. But the, the security bar gets raised dramatically. Because there's but over time, there will be consolidation, right? Yeah, there's competition today, but over time, there will be consolidation. And so maybe 10 years from now, you'll go yeah. back to having one security bundled, vendor Bundled, unbundled. Yeah, Somebody so maybe, will look at this. So maybe the same thing happens. You see it on the desktop right too, now. right? Like, you know, it's been 30 years, but, you know, there were all these innovative new apps and ideas for what to do with a desktop computer, and they flourished. And it was unfortunately really hard to distribute software back then if you didn't pay for yeah. shelf space, et cetera. But fundamentally, um, there were winners and losers, and the 80s happened. And, right. and then what happened after a while is innovation kind of slowed down. The platform, the OS has got too much control, in my opinion, for innovation to really happen. And then you saw a lot of rebundling right. together of all these services. And now with you know the cloud and with collaboration, it's almost like everyone's taking a stab at those new businesses again. I love it. I love seeing. I mean, you know, who thought there'd like, be a new yeah. word processor? I mean, people use Quip now. I mean, what engineer five years ago said, "I'm going to go build a new word processor"? You know, pre iPhone, nobody would have yeah. created a new, a new, you know, Microsoft Office or WordPerfect or Lotus. Like nobody was like, I, I'm into that business. And it now was, you have Evernote, not approachable, right? Google Docs. Totally. Let's let's switch over to Google for a second. Uh, people are talking about the search business plateauing. I guess when you take all of it, it starts to plateau. Um, just like Facebook sort of plateaus when they reach every person who's online. Um, but uh, Yahoo took a little piece of it when they got the Firefox, so they actually went down in the United States for the first time, Google, in a decade, I guess, instead of going up. And But you have Google running the table on a bunch of other spaces, and Chrome and Android seem to be doing pretty well. What do you think the outlook for Google is, generally speaking? I would be super bullish on Google. I think Google is probably one of the most strategic companies in the in the tech ecosystem and I think that first of all I think their numbers are probably wildly underreported I think they probably have much larger market share than people actually know and realize I bet it does, I don't think it gets tracked appropriately and accurately yeah a lot of people have said that why, why do you think the tracking is off because I, I think that today like page views are these things that are sort of hard to measure and you know pages are very dynamic and contextual and you're relying on third party people that monitor and nobody actually sees all the traffic between the use, end users and Google and with Android having a bunch of Google services built in it's sometimes hard to tell right I mean I think that Anything that sits between the end user and clicking on an ad is of that strategic purview for Google, and right. they will do anything they need to do to, to defend that. Like if you want to, if you want to go after Google, there's lots of ways to attack them, right? But if you want to, if you want to get 10,000 engineers, lawyers, and everyone inside of the, the Googleplex pointing their fingers, keyboards, and guns at you, it's you go after that that sweet spot of anything that's between the user and the and the advertisement. And they, I think they've shown that they're willing with Chrome. I mean, Chrome puts you right in front of the user, and they're right. doing it on mobile with Android too. I mean, it's, I think it's very strategic for them and I would be bullish only because I think they they have worked very hard to be some of the smartest people in the room right. and today like you know you can't arbitrage Google's ad network you know like you can't like there used to be people for a little while that I mean you know this yeah they would like buy ads on Yahoo and then show pages with Google ads right and right. they would they, but like you can't do those tricks anymore it's because it's too efficient yeah they're just the way too efficient too and, and you can't build a new ad network I think at least in the the current rules to, to upset them you have to attack them from other angles and today they launched like Facebook done has done this for social they've yeah. been out Social Google by leaps yeah, and bounds. Yeah, Google yeah. has no shot in social. Right. They, they can't figure it out. But now they launched domains today. I've been using that product for a little bit in the beta. It's pretty dynamic. Yeah, to register domain names. Yeah, yeah, because that's a market that you know the best, the best player, the biggest player right now. I think is like GoDaddy, which tries to upsell you every every hour with an email. Right. Right. I mean, that's True. that's that's not a hard bar to, to reach. What do you think of Google in 2015? I, don't I, I would actually agree. I, what I like about Google is. Um, they have a good fundamental sense of what are the right long-term problems to focus on, like what what's big and what's going to be huge. And also where lovers of power are. Like I, I was very impressed with Chrome when they went down that path um, because, you know, look, people thought – I mean, John Lilly is a good friend of mine. He, you know, was running Firefox. But, you know, people were asking questions like, why are we pushing so hard on Firefox like IE1? They fought for kind of no open web matters. Um, so when Chrome came in, it wasn't obvious, like, well, why not lean into yeah. Firefox? Um, but, you know, that position of kind of, well, if, you know, at minimum, this forces the market to adopt kind of application like JavaScript, high speed, you know, functionality. And on the other side, if it actually is popular, wow, like we are an old enough company that we remember the days where the software entry point matters. So as pro-web a company as Google is, it'd be very easy for a company with Google's DNA to argue, oh, well, the web is everything, so it doesn't matter what frame I'm putting it in. Um, they are an old enough company to actually remember the PC era to go, no, there's actually power in being that entry point as well. And I think that's helped them at times with mobile. Um, I think, by the way, Apple, of course, has that DNA because they're old enough. Yeah. Um, you know, Microsoft as well uh, has it in it. But... Um, I just I continue to be amazed at their willingness. It's not because they don't 
fall down, right? I mean, yeah. we, we could list all the Google projects and things that oh they God, yeah. should be investing in that they're not investing in. But man, when they lean in to big strategic things, they have been well, Chrome more right than, than and not. the Chrome OS, I think, are huge sleepers because I had the Pixel Book. I don't know if you guys ever got to yeah. play with that. It's good. It's unbelievable. I almost made it my default desktop. Probably the, the battery most, sucked. It's probably the most secure. A Chromebook is probably the most secure computer you can buy today if you want, a, if you want an actual computer. So why are they not being deployed in enterprises while Google Apps is? The same Google Apps companies yeah, think, are doing think, Macs, not Google Apps. Is it because they don't make the hardware too? No, a couple of things. I think that they're actually taking the Apple strategy of they're putting it into every school that they possibly they're can. They're crushing it in schools, aren't yeah, they? So I think every kid is going to grow up with a Chromebook. And right. that's very, Apple did that, and it's a long-term play, and it's very, very smart so that you grow up knowing how to use a Chromebook. Uh, so I think people, that, again, it is a little bit of a sleeper. Uh, I think you'll see it have more inroads, whether it's Android or Chrome OS uh, in enterprises. I mean, Android is probably on the cusp of having a real enterprise adoption. Um, I think what Adam said about, about you know, Google having a long-term or, or, or a historical perspective is right. I mean, th I mean, there used to be people that thought that nothing could topple Netscape, that they had Navigator, and that that was going to be the end-all, be-all. And then, like, Yahoo is like, well, we don't need a browser. We just need this portal, right? And, like, everyone's like, oh, my God, who needs Netscape? Who needs the browser when you can just have the portal? The homepage is king, right? right? And then all of a sudden, Google's like, well, we don't even need the portal. We just want, like, the search box, right? Now, if you think of Chrome, it is just that canvas with a search box. And if you look right. at Google Now on Android, it's just a search box. And I think they're trying to find what is the right medium in all these different applications, whether it's mobile or, or desktop. But because they have that historical perspective to try to realize, like, what is that next thing? And, is you know, there an Achilles heel? I mean, People talk about apps and people no longer go and search for a restaurant, they go directly yeah. to Yelp. Like any company, they're gonna I mean they have they're always gonna have innovators dilemma issues. Right. And they've shown themselves, you know, like Facebook's shown itself pretty well to not be uh, willing to be held back by by its existing businesses to go into new businesses. I mean they bought Oculus, which might be that next thing. Maybe you don't need a, a frame, a canvas anymore, you know, on your screen. Maybe you just need an Oculus VR. Have either of you used the new Oculus or the old one? No, but the reports at a CES are that, like mind blowing. Right? Well, that's the thing is, I was kind of dissing it on. I was just dissing VR in general right. online. It seems ridiculous. Because I've watched this movie for 20 years since like Mark Pesci and Jaron Lanier were talking about VR ML and we were going to like flow through 3D space and like Yahoo would become a bunch of file cabinets right. we'd we open the, up. We saw the movie The Wizard. Right? Yeah, you know, The Wizard or whatever, 13th Floor, I guess. Where the, there's a whole bunch of them, Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah, it was just well. seemed like it was less efficient to you know, go and navigate space, then just look at the Wikipedia page, right? And I used the first Oculus, it was terrible. I thought it was terrible. I was like, why would anybody use this except for maybe gaming or porn or something? But now there seems to be something about this new one, and Chris Dixon's like, you really shouldn't judge it until you see it. I'm like, well, the venture capitalists who made a $2 billion selling it to the, you know. Other company that they're To in. the other company that they're on the board of, right. like, kind of hard to know what's exactly going on there, but, do, do you guys see any application for either augmented reality, which nobody has made an application that actually does anything in the real world, or virtual reality and the glasses? Uh, what applications can, are we going to be using 10 years from now? Don't you have a Fitbit or anything? Yeah, I got the, I got the basis yeah. watch. I'm that, that, that's, that's on the cusp. Of, I mean, it's not in your eye like an implant, but I mean, to me, that augments my reality. Because you know your steps and your yeah, heart rate. of course. And I think, you know, it gamifies those things. And, like, if you're close to your 10,000 steps, you'll walk around the block one more time. Yeah. I mean, those, those to me are all just, like, So what, you'll have, harbingers. we'll be wearing glasses that tell us our steps instead of looking sure, at our watch? Know. I mean, that, you can already do that for ski goggles. Yeah. Look, if, if you're asking, you know, is everyone putting their face down into their smartphone, like the ultimate interface to access yeah. on-the-go information? It obviously isn't. Um, I, I'm in the camp, you know, I did a lot of research early before flipping into actual building products. Products. And I remember, you know, the lab I was in, in in the ATG, Apple's advanced technology group in the late 90s was all about augmented reality. It was all about we, all these experiments, et cetera. And so there's always a joke that these things take 20 years to move their way out of the lab. And, and, and frankly, that was the 90s. And that was the 90s. And, and so we're, getting, we we're getting close. Um, I don't know what the right interfaces are. The, the question and the idea that there's a lot of relevant information to you, but there's a lot more noise, mm -hmm. and that having this personalized context of getting you the right information at the right time with the context of what you're looking at, what you're thinking about, what's going on, the biometrics, all these other things, um, it's a really complex problem. So there'll be more failures than winners. But augmented reality, I would actually agree these devices that are going to creep into us are going to start layering information. And then we're going we're to see that some of them are better than others. 
others, right? And looking down the smartphone isn't the best way to do everything. Right. Um, and then for a virtual reality, um, look, I, I, I've always loved gaming. Um, to me, the idea that this may start in gaming um, yeah. is not uh, is not diminishing at all. Right. Because actually, um, uh, I actually think that that will get you the dollars and investment to keep it's pushing. It's clearly it like a huge further. win for if, if they can make it be as pleasurable as playing an Xbox. Sure, it's going to be an awesome gaming experience. I'm just wondering, like, are we going to be walking around the street with goggles on? Or is there is the next version going to be glasses, more like Google right. Glass, which seems to be DOA now? They've kind of given up. Well, lots or, of people walk around with glasses today, right, or contacts. But not Google Glass. No, but they have contacts on, and, sure. and who knows what, what's possible, right? So you but think contacts look at, look or Look at, like, F-16 fighters. They have the HUD. They have the heads-up display so that they don't have to take their eyes off of their field of view. Yeah. Right? And my car has a thing that shows me when I should turn left or right, on the, and it projects it out on the street in front I had of me. That. What kind of car is that? It's an Audi. And, uh, not a Tesla. No. <laughs> Audi. Really? Yeah, I think I drive too much. I'm still too much Southern California in me to, to get a Tesla. You gotta get the Tesla. Model. Well, I, Uber is my primary vehicle these of days. Of course, thank so, you. Uh, now, what about Lux? Have you tried the Lux Valet yet? I have not. I, that that to me for for right now is a bridge too far that I can't park my own car. Uh, I still feel it's like it's pretty park, ridiculous. Is it? These people show up in a scooter. I've done it three times. Okay. It's fifteen dollars. You know about Lux? Yeah, that's a lot of money. Have you done it? I have not done it. Oh, but that includes the parking cost. It's everything. Oh, fifteen dollars total. So what I realized was I like taking Uber better because I can work. Right, you're at Union Square though, and you want to park, and you don't want to pay fifteen bucks. Well, here's the thing: the lot here across from us at um, the uh, WeWork, yeah. uh, in the middle of the uh, Twitter loin, is ten dollars. I give the guy a four dollar tip, five dollar tip to put me in the front so I can get out quick. Yep. So it costs me fifteen bucks a day. And I did the Lux thing, and I was like, wait a second. The guy's waiting outside the door at 25 Taylor Street, as opposed to me having to wait in line to give him the car. That saved me five minutes. And then when I pick up, he's waiting outside or she's waiting outside, and it's the same price. So then I tracked it, and they were parking at a lot two blocks away. So I was like, wait a second. Because the Tesla shows you where the car's parked. Right. So I was like, where are they going with my Tesla? I find out where they're going with my Tesla. I'm like, they're parked in another lot that costs... $10, $12 a day. How is this possible for them to make any money with a $20 an hour, I think it's a $15 an hour person doing valet? Turns out they're buying the spots yep. at a discount. So they have a bunch of spots around the city. They got cheap and they're rotating cars yeah, in front of them. It works really well. There's no way it can ever make money. Is it a big enough business? Yeah. It just can never make money. Right. There's no way it can ever. It only works money. in certainly certain metros. All right. Lightning round. What is the startup slash product your most impressed in love with now emerging not google etc what are you looking at now that you're like wow that that is just smart i'm obsessed with it it could be a game it could be an app it could be a founder who's doing something interesting where are you spending your time where do you look at and go wow this is killer i i mean i don't know if you can call it a startup i am pretty impressed with buzzfeed and how they yeah. they've really made the move from sort of a toy of listicles and like yeah. stupid cats falling off roofs to doing some real journalism, which I think is uh, undervalued, underappreciated, and certainly undercompensated uh, in today. So I mean, I I I, I look at my I look at uh, the space of where I spend my time, and it's, it's like I'm embarrassed that I read BuzzFeed, and yet I'm like, this is real content. This is real news. So you sort through the link baiting nonsense, no, and they, you find great journalism. BuzzFeed's done a better job now of like you can like sort of like so be like I want to be in like real BuzzFeed, like real news, or like I want to be in like link sharing BuzzFeed. Ah. Ah. You, can, you can now find actual news. You know Buzzfeed. what I call that? Bad. High and low publishing. And really, Ariana Huffington gets the... Um, yeah, HuffPo. For HuffPo really did create this concept, which is they were paying a bunch of writers with no bylines to write, like rewrite every story on the internet for right. 20 bucks with no byline, 150 words, get the SEO, social juice. But then they had people they were paying a lot of money or were suddenly George Clooney to do something on the homepage. Yep. So whenever Matt cuts at Google or somebody would say like, oh my God, you're link bait, and they would point to the examples of not. And that's what BuzzFeed has done. They've hired a bunch of world-class journalists. So when people say like, oh, you're stealing all these images and doing all these gifts from a TV show, they're like, yeah, no, no, we did that stupid thing, but we also have this great thing. So you can get your New York Times high with your low, upworthy nonsense. Yep. And you're falling for this. All, you all love day, it. All day long. How many times do you check BuzzFeed a day? Three? Uh, no, more? usually at night. But I can get Be lost. Honest. It's like the way I used to get lost in Wikipedia, ah. I get lost in BuzzFeed. 
And do you have a specific journalist or genre that they do so well for you that you no, find yourself going to? No, the, to? Only, the only thing I'm more, the only thing, I, the only other site that I would say, I mean, this one actually I pay money to is The Information, which I think also right. breaks real news and I think has good editorials and good content. And You, you know, like paying 400 bucks for that? I wouldn't say I like it. What's the I, price you would think it should be? So what I think, I mean, I've, I've already told Jessica Lesson, yeah. who runs it, I've already told her this, which is I think that they should charge basically corporate accounts on a percentage of revenue for the company. Because I think that, look, if you're Google, you can just, you can just pay 20 grand for a site-wide license or 100 grand or whatever it is. And if you're a smaller company and you only have, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 million in revenue, you should pay less. And if you have zero in revenue, you should pay maybe only 50 bucks a year. Right. And there are business models that charge based on the company's revenue. And uh, I think for, for the information, it would be interesting to do the those corporate accounts. To do those corporate accounts. I pay for it now. I got to redo my subscription. But I was yeah. sort of like, but like four hundred dollars to me as an individual is a lot. But as a corporation, four hundred dollars is nothing. Right. Which is why I don't think they police you sharing the email, the sign in, or whatever. If you had five executives on, I don't think they care right now. Adam, what are you seeing that you're super impressed with? You angel invest or no? Uh, I do a little bit. I'm obviously pretty busy, so I can't do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, full time, but I probably do about four to six a year. What have you done recently, and what do you like? Um, yeah, that's I, the biggest test of you like. I, I was thinking about those trends. I mean, obviously, um, uh, I see a lot in fintech, etc. But um, you know, uh, I was saying that the trend I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm still a big believer in. You know, so I'm not an investor, but I, I actually watch Quip's evolution quite a bit. What's Quip? Uh, Quip is Brett Taylor. Uh, the um, it, it's basically Facebook it's, CTO, friend feed. Yeah, it started as a as a basically a word processing in the cloud with collaboration built in. Q U I P Quip. Yep. Yeah, I remember this. Mold from the ground up. We use it at Wealthfront. Um, and what I love about it is it's evolving differently. Yeah, it gets right? better it's and not, better. It's not the uh, straight Google Docs playbook if we're just going to move Office to the cloud and, and mm -hmm. figure out how to get as many Excel functions in there as possible. They're doing a little bit of reimagination of what features matter. How do you in interoperate the, you know, the the spreadsheet and the document? Um, but when I'm on the go, I can be in the back of a cab, co-authoring a, a document, and actually works on mobile, whether it's uh, phone, tablet, desktop. I find the integration phenomenally seamless. So and they're so I, going against. Are they going against HipChat and Slack no, with the Google, chat features? Google Docs. Just Google Docs, because I see they had a chat. Yeah, well, it's always been part of, of, of the experiences that I think they, I want to speak for them, but I think what they realize, we know from our usage, is that a lot of the useful activity is actually the discussion around the document and the issues that the document raises. So actually, the the how do we master 500 revisions of the document not actually as interesting as the like, yeah, I have a problem with this. Where's that source from? Oh, it's from here. And then the owner kind of making the call. It has a lot of API integration now, so you can automatically push things in different directions directions. Hmm. Um, and so I did a seed investment, not in, in Quip, but in a company uh, a little more than a year ago uh, called Figma that's that's down in Silicon Valley that's trying to do uh, similar things around uh, photos um, and editing, which of course um, has not... F-I-G-M-A? Yes. Uh, Dylan... Uh, Field, um, who was famous for being, a, I think, a, one of the Teal fellows. Um, really brilliant guy, really Can't brilliant team. Figma. F I G M A. Huh. Um, and Not so, uh, yes. And so, um, I just like this entire trend. Oh, wow. You know, I don't think this is launched yet. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> The guy, anyway, um, but anyway, so yeah. it's collaboration on photos. Got yeah, it. and so um, I, I like that entire trend of um, uh, learning. Personally, I, I learn a lot from user experience. Think of the cloud collaboration. I'm still a guy who watches gaming quite closely, right? Like I learn yeah. a lot about the future of communication, um, watching how discussion happens in Clash of Clans, and watching how. Um, 10-year-olds, adults, young adults, et cetera. They're communicating. They're doing something. I love the iteration, how they figure out the economics. There's so much complexity at so many levels to make a cloud-based service that actually drives something like Clash of Clans and have it drive a billion dollars. I get a lot of insight about where things are going in communication, virality, mm -hmm. um, hooks. Like I always think that gaming is on the front edge of a lot of those things. So we're going to basically no go to different. work and form clans at work is what you're saying. So we're going to form a clan to get a project done. Well, I will say even, I mean, I don't want it to sound trivial, but, uh, and I am like a, you know, I have uh, kids and so I watch them develop and always think about how they're using technology. Yeah, Michael. Um, but, you know, the way that kids use YouTube is fundamentally different than, I think, 
What do you folks think the like fundamental us? difference is? Um, I think that they um, their willingness to surf the engine, how they blend search with kind of the recommendations, um, how they find the stuff that they actually like, how they share it with their friends, how they talk yeah. about it, what influences them. Um, you know, in, in Clash of Clans, you know, where Supercell, obviously it's amazing, but actually I discovered that, you know, when I'm traveling, um, number one way I can talk to my son um, is not a text message. It's certainly not an email. It, it, it's none of the normal communication platforms. But he's probably on Clash of Clans. And I go on the message board in the same clan and, and chat with him. He'll probably be there whether I'm in the airport, etc. How old is he? He's 10. How much is his allowance for Clash of Clans? And has he gone over? No more gems. Really? No more gems. Yeah, we don't. What's the most he spent? Hundred? There was a, there was a, it's a funny story. This is like parenting in the 21st century, but there's yeah, a real story where for a while I was loving it because an allowance didn't work with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, that whole idea that if I had five bucks, I could go to the corner store and buy a candy bar. Like right. my chores, wife's not going to let him go to buy a right. candy bar anyway, so there's nothing to go get. Right. Um, so when we discovered you know, the, the fact that actually like helped me in the yard all day and earn a couple ah. bucks, ah. that didn't work. Work in the yard all day and get a and get five hundred gems. Right. Work too well, and so it actually became a little bit too much of a thing where it was like, "What can I do today?" To I heard earn more gems. We had, we had to unwind it. Are there controls you can put on the device to prevent them from doing it on their own? Yeah, well, I just don't enable the iTunes account for purchase. Oh, oh well, now what they have yeah. is. On the iTunes, they just set up a family thing, which That's I haven't like, uh, configured so you yet. Like deposit because um, my daughter's five. But when they request something, it goes to mom and dad. Mom and dad say, "Hey, Junior has asked to for five hundred coins. Yes or no?" Got it. Boom. What Apple needs to do is, and what Netflix needs to do is, and YouTube is, they want to watch this number of videos or this time and let you time it. Yep. I just I looked at a company that I'm going to invest in, which is doing uh, a tablet. An Android tablet for kids with um, autism. Yep. And the way it's working is they have made like their own sort of Angry Birds type games. If you do an exercise about telling time or about interacting with people or expressing emotions or whatever it is, vocabulary, if you get through it, you get to play the Angry Birds. If you get through this, you get to play that for this many minutes. So the same dynamic of um, hey, Junior wants 500 coins to play Clash of Clans. What if they had to get through and correctly do, this is the other startup I want to do, Khan Academy and Clash of Clans. Hmm. Somebody does the glue between them. So I could say to my daughter, if you get through a, every time you get through 10 Khan Academies correct, and somebody's going to test you, whatever, I don't know how it works, you get this many coins for, or this many, much time to watch Justice League in Netflix. Can you imagine how amazing that would be? Yeah, and let them do it at school. Who cares? You're at school. You got through the 10 lessons. Go play Clash of Clans for 20 minutes. The other kid's going slower. No Clash of Clans for you. <laughs> Too slow at math. It's harsh. It's pretty harsh. Yeah, well, I'm always impressed with kids. Uh, you know, this is why I like gaming also. Uh, it's always fun to watch how it pushes their math skills in this bizarre way. Like you have kids who are pushing in different directions. You, you wouldn't see them lean into math. But, man, do they know how many days and, and how much they have to save up to earn level six giants. Like they know that math. Right. So That's, it's, it's they're all learning amazing. that. And I remember sure. when I was in gaming, when I started, I was in the Age of Empires for a long time mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. I love that real-time strategy nonsense, right. StarCraft. I was actually reading some of the websites 10 years ago explaining the math of, mm -hmm. you know, archers versus barbarians versus this versus that. They really need to in include more of that. It would be great if they had a – if they got a team of – mathematicians and scientists together to make Age of Empires again, but explain the math and science of arrows versus swords. I mean, we would have so many kids able to cure cancer. Or well, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, listen. This has been an amazing episode. It's gone on for far too long. These two individuals are very important. They've got to get back to running their companies. Adam Nash is Adam Nash on Twitter. Uh, David Ulovich is David U. Uh, anything to plug? You're hiring developers, I take it? Of course, always. Hiring developers, perhaps? Absolutely. All right, here you go. If you're a developer and you want to work for a company where the stock is going to be worth a ton of money, I can guarantee you that. Now, these individuals can't. I can tell you, you're being pretty dumb not to come work for one of these companies. So if you have a CS degree and you're making a ton of money, go work at OpenDNS or Wealthfront. And I generally tell people, you just say, hey, I saw you on the show. I'm a great developer. You email first name at 
domain name tends to work for CEOs. And if they know you watch the show and that you got a great uh, thing, you might get an interview. Who knows? Uh, thanks to Brandon, Nathan, Bryce, J&J, John, Luke, Drew, Matt, Julian, all the great people I have on my team. And the inside team is crushing it as well. Uh, the show is TWI Startups on the Twitter and we're starting to get into the Instagram and you know I'm at Jason. Thanks to sponsors, GoToMeeting and Lead Genius. Two great companies. All right, we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.